Namotasa Pakawato Arahato Sama Samputasa Namotasa Pakawato Arahato Sama Samputasa Namotasa Pakawato Arahato Sama Samputasa Uttang Dhammang Sankang Namasami Good day to everyone. Uh, before I um, say a few words about Lom Po Cha, I'd, I'd like to express my uh, deep gratitude and anemotana to all the organizers, the sponsors, the kapiyas, the volunteers, and uh, all the participants here. This kind of gathering is, is uh, very rare for me. And to be with a community this large of bhikkhus and lay people is a, is a huge privilege. So, anamotana to everyone who's worked so hard to, to organize this sadhu. Brother Sian asked me to reflect on my life with Lompo Cha. And as Lompo Liam was speaking yesterday and and then we heard Lompa Sumedho and Lompa Pasano and other teachers. And I realized that uh, I wouldn't have met Lompa Liam without Lompa Cha. I wouldn't have met Lompa Sumedho without Lompa Cha. I wouldn't be a part of this Sangha, these beautiful peers that I live with. Uh, I wouldn't be a part of this. I wouldn't be a part of your community. So the gratitude I have to Lone Pa Cha is, is not just about him, but it's all that he created. I, I thought I'd like to reflect on the, the kind of particular spiritual genius he had in terms of lifestyle, in terms of how to live a spiritual life. So if you can picture me, I was a 26-year-old, slightly long-haired traveler, and I had some ideas of Buddhism, not much, and then I come into a culture where there is, first of all, the idea of enlightenment. I didn't even have that in my culture. And, and maybe here, you take that for granted, but just think of it. My, I, I guess the heroes of my culture were um, philosophers, hockey players, artists, Mick Jagger, that <laughs> kind of stuff. And to have a culture where the highest person in the culture is an arahant, is a, uh, an enlightened bhikkhu, this didn't even, in, didn't even exist in my culture. And so Lumpo Cha uh, lived and taught within that cultural format. When I when I came to Thailand, which was in 1973, I, I ordained as a samanera at a, a temple in Bangkok. And there, the, the only thing I was taught was a, was a technique, a way to meditate. But I wasn't really taught a lifestyle. When I made my way with good fortune up to Ubon and asked to stay with Ajahn Chah, uh, I, I came into another cultural format which I had never seen before. A group of men who were strong, determined, um, who lived a way which was manly, but also very gentle. And, and this really impressed me. So the to see Lompa Liam or Lompa Jan or Lompa Aneg, these great beings who have affected my life, having strong, 
uh, sense of determination, being able to meditate and work with great strength and vigor, but not in a aggressive, uh, macho kind of way. The way they would relate to Lompo Cha with great humility, with great deference, uh, with great beauty. I'd never seen that before. All my associations with men, men's groups through sport and, and things like that were tended to be competitive, uh, a lot of aggression, fair bit of misogynism, things which were oftentimes not so beautiful. So to then come into this whole different culture of um, a, a group of men and then embedded it in a society which encouraged their spiritual work. So the part of the, what I reflect upon, part of the genius of Lompo Cha's development of Wap Vapong and, and, and the monasteries there was he, he, he understood the Vinaya and the discipline of the monk in such a way as a fellow like me, who knew no Thai language, who had very, very, very little experience of meditation, who had some pretty sloppy mental habits, um, could come into this situation and begin to pick up a lifestyle which was designed for liberation from suffering. And I had never seen that before either. So if you, any of you who have been at one of our forest monasteries, just take something very simple like uh, morning chanting. Um, from what I remember, Wat Bapong, I think the morning bell went at 3 a.m. or 3.30 a.m. And then we gathered for, for the morning chanting. When I went into the sala, the first few times, I tended to be late. And everyone was on time, even the senior monks. So right, right there, there was a teaching. The, the standard that I was expected to keep was to be early if I was a junior. And that, that didn't require words. One of the things that is often asked of me vis-a-vis -vis my stay with Lompa Cha is how could you understand him when you didn't speak Thai? Well, his genius was that he set up the monastery such that if, if you were sincere, if you were attentive, you could pretty well pick up how to live as a bhikkhu. And so you imagine this young fellow, 26, pretty keen, but a sometimes lazy fellow, um, comes to the meditation late, then he starts to feel remorse, no, people are feeding me, I have to try, starts to come to the meditation on time, starts to come early. And then just picture that meditation hall, there were 50 monks and maybe eight Samaneras. I was a Samanera, so I was at the back of the hall. You have 50 monks, uh, men who are striving to realize Nibbana, sitting together. And their ethos is not to move, not to leave early, to stay for the two hours or whatever of the meditation after the chanting and so on. So my Meditation posture was not a posture. It was sort of a body folded on the ground that didn't quite know how to sit even. And, and so it was, it was very, very difficult, but constantly I have these reflections of other men striving. Lompo Liam sitting there, or uh, Lompo Jandi, or all my peers, and they were modeling for me uh, a way of strength, a way of courage, a way of determination, which I didn't really 
have naturally. I wasn't, I don't think I was a weak person, but that whole system drew out of me very good qualities. And, and, and so reflecting on what Ajahn Jayasaro said yesterday, I could, I could really relate to his ideas of, of Kalyanamitta, that Lompo Cha was such a being that he could a- allow you to see qualities and strengths in yourself which you didn't know you had, which you didn't know even existed. And then you get 50 men doing that. Very powerful, very, very powerful. And that, that whole ethos would carry me, no matter what Ajahn Chah said, it would carry me. Same with the evening meditations. And then, of course, we we'll hear these great stories of Lumpur Chah giving long, 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 long talks. <laughs> and I do mean long. And you, again, you picture this poor, pathetic 26-year-old now. He's sitting there, and he doesn't know what is being said. And he looks at the clock after half an hour. His concentration now is totally collapsed. And he observes the other monks. They don't even move. And you be, I began to learn, okay, so the etiquette here is that I have to be still. And I can't sneak out. And I, I have some pride, right? And I want to be a part of this group because I respect them. So I start to have to sit still. Not meditate. Just sit still and endure. And endure. And endure. Now, what's the point of that? Why not go have a sandwich? Right? Why not go watch TV? Well, I didn't come for the sandwich or the TV. I came for enlightenment. And as the teaching is given to us, the cause of suffering is attachment to craving. So then having to sit there and and taking on that discipline because I was inspired by this group of men as well as Ajahn Chah, I realized, okay, how can I sit still and not suffer? Physically, it was horrible. Concrete floors and a body which was not flexible. It became flexible. I was young. But in, in the simplicity of a, an ascetic standard of not moving became a great teaching. How can I sit here listening to someone I love and respect, but I don't know what he's saying, not move and not suffer? Not, 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 it's, it wasn't an academic lesson. It was an existential imperative if I was going to survive. <laughs> if I was going to survive in this monastery, I had to learn how to not suffer within discomfort, pain, and extreme boredom. Because it was extremely boring to sit in a room and listen to two hours of this radiant being talking, the radiance would carry me for a while, but then the pain and discomfort would take over. And then I'd say to myself, well, what's the problem? Well, he won't stop talking. That's the problem. (laughs) No, that's that's not the problem, Viridamo. What's the problem is I don't want to be here. I want to go to sleep and I want some ice cream, anything. (laughs) So if you do that day in and day out, day in and day out, and you've got 50 men who are really serious and sincere in this practice and you have some some drive and some intensity in yourself, you start to see, ah, okay, I can learn to be patient with discomfort. I can learn to be patient with boredom. 
And after a while, it becomes an interesting challenge. And so the development of barami, the development of strengths, which I didn't know I had to develop. I had no idea what I had to develop. I had no idea. So that when I would go to Lompoc Cha and bemoan my fate and say my meditation is pathetic and I can't digest sticky rice, and he would say, Oton, endure, be patient. Now, he could say it with, with profundity because I trusted him. I had deep, deep trust in his, his realization and his understanding of human, the human predicament. Another person might say, just endure. I say, oh, it's all right for you. But because Lomp, you know, because Lompo Cha, like, like just that Lompo Cha would take the time to listen to me, to listen to a 27-year-old scatterbrain guy <laughs> and actually consider my problems and consider my questions. I felt honored. You know, why should this beautiful man and being, what? what's in it for him? Nothing, really. And so if he gave me very simple advice, like endure, I'd say, okay, I'll give that a go. So it was profound. It's just one word, because that's much of, you know, I couldn't understand much more. But it was profound because it came from profundity. And he said, you know, you're, you're, you expect to be a Buddha in six months where well, you were just a hippie for three years? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And, and so the, the simple patterns of monastic life and, and the culture and the, and the structure of the micro-society that we had at Wapapong, and we continue to have, uh, was, I thought, the genius of Lumpur Cha. Huh? So, so within that, I, I, as, I, I, as I lived at Wat Bapong and other monasteries, I had a lifestyle. Before that, I only had a technique. And you can't live life walking slowly the rest of your life. You'll never get to the toilet. <laughs> so... There has to be something more than walking slowly and watching your nose. And so Ajahn Chah created a, a actually, a, once I got used to it, a very beautiful life. Just his, say, training in Vinaya, um, his, his, his attention to detail. We all know the the kind of famous Ajahn Chah adage, if you want to see a good monastery, look at the toilet. And it's very true. You know, if, if the monks are caring for the monastery, taking care of it, cleaning the toilets and so on, there'll be a certain standard and quality of awareness and mindfulness. And, and that was very profound. You know, to have a, to be able to look at how the other monks um, made things, cared for things, um, took care of their teachers. All of that was uh, a learning which was not just a meditation technique. It was a way of relating to things, to requisites, to people. Take something like upatak, this word we use for caring for your teacher. That didn't exist in my culture. I would never wash someone's, a man's clothes, let alone wash his feet. That's bizarre. And yet, and yet to have uh, a senior monk that you respect, to be able to be given the opportunity to wash his robes, to wash his feet, was, was, was really beautiful. But in my culture, that, that didn't exist. I mean, you'd be considered weird to be doing that. And so this, this I, I think men, um, we're, we're, men need to be manly, but I think they also need to be gentle. And, and that combination I learned, like a father learns it to be 
hopefully kind to his wife and to his children. Um, we, as monks, we don't have that access to gentility, so we have to develop it in other ways. And this training in Upatak, where you, you look out, what's your teacher doing? What does he need? How can you help him? Are you okay? Um, was a beautiful training, really beautiful. And when I had the chance to take care of my mom, I lived with her for a while, and I had a chance to upatak my mom. And that was lovely. All, those, all that refinement of sensitivity and care was then able to manifest in the care of my mother. So it made me a, 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 a better human being. And in that gentle sense, and then the manliness, the kind of um, the virility of, of working hard, doing a lot of formal meditation and so on, that was necessary too, and that was encouraged by the whole thing, by the whole life there. The, the, the relationship to the, to the laity that Lung Po Cha always encouraged us to be grateful for the for the requisites, um, the, this, the very experience of Pindapad, not something I have in my culture, it's something that we're trying to develop, but going out into a village, receiving alms food from hardworking farming people, coming back, sharing the meal, this was, this was always a, a kind of lovely part of the day, and connected me to the incredible opportunity that Wapopong offered. Here I was, a Westerner, 26 years old, uh, who hadn't really given anything to Thai society, hadn't offered anything, and people were saying to me, if you want to be a bhikkhu, and you want to train in this way, we'll support you, and we'll ask nothing in return. We won't want to ask you to be a teacher or write a book or build a monastery. We just want you to be enlightened. And you imagine that? What society has this cultural possibility of giving a man a life stipend <laughs> to get enlightened? It's astounding, isn't it? And as a monk, I say, well, why doesn't everyone want to do this? Why not all go for it? So that opportunity was created for me through Ajahn Chah's kindness in accepting me. I do wonder if I had just stayed in a town monastery doing a technique, I don't think I would have lasted because you can't live that way. One of the features of what Lompo Cha taught was the, the kind of requirement that each monk learns how to make his own requisites, that we make our, sew our own robes, that we make bowl stands and umbrellas and, and all these things. And that sense of craft that you find at Wat Pong still and in the monasteries, I really enjoyed that. And to have ways of mindful practice which weren't just... Uh, sitting and walking meditation. They were important. We did a lot of that. But to be mindful in sewing your robes, to be mindful in um, collecting the dye for, making the dye for your, to color your robes, to cut bamboo, to make a bowl stand. All of these were, were things in the ordinary life of Wat Bapong, and they continue to be, that created a, a possibility of, of practicing mindfulness steadily throughout the day, caring for the place, caring for your teacher, um, listening to, to long desanas, all developed uh, baramita in me, then I, I, but I didn't really know that was going on. You, you don't quite often when you're in the midst of it. And Anjan Cha would just keep encouraging us to just live the life, do this and see what happens. So the way the mind works now, I'm in this life as a young monk, and I'm no longer pursuing my old habits of distraction, but I'm pursuing 
ways of being which are present, which are mindfulness, which are reflective. And that began to have quite a good impact on me. And I began to really love the life. And then I began to understand a bit of Thai and understand more, to some extent, the profundity of his, of his teaching. But even if I didn't understand the words, just to be in his kuti and, and feel the wisdom and joy of this man would, would motivate me to go back to my kuti and practice some more. And that sense of drawing out of me things that I didn't know I had was probably one of the greatest gifts he gave me. That gift of, of you can do it. You know, and, and for, for many of us, for me, I was I had a lot of self-doubts. I was in a different culture. Uh, you know, like I had typhus and all kinds of physical difficulties and then the difficulty of training the mind, a lot of anxiety, and you think, I can't do this. This is impossible. This is too tough for me. And then Lompocha says, what ton? Stick with it. Give it five years and you'll feel, you'll feel just a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> but it was right. It was true. And because he himself was a profound being, you could take that on board. Say, okay, I'll, I'll give that a go. And, and the results would slowly come. So then as I, as I started to, to understand his teaching, from what I can remember, one of the really central features in the way he was encouraging me would to, to say that where there is dirt, there is clean. Where there is anger, there is freedom from anger. Where there is fear, there is freedom from fear. Where there is lust, there is freedom from lust, and so on. Where there is boredom, there is freedom from boredom. So then in the middle of a three-hour talk, when I felt very bored, I said, what do you mean there is freedom from boredom? I'm really bored. I don't get it. And then he, 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 I began to see he was... To me, he was talking about two things. One was that if I was willing to bear witness to negative feelings, such as fear and boredom, and not attach to them through thought, then they would begin to cease. And the dominant factor would be the, peaceful of Amer the peacefulness of awareness. So I could see that progression slowly, terribly slowly, begin to work. That where in the midst of anxiety, by witnessing anxiety, the strength of anxiety begins to lessen and the strength of witnessing awareness begins to become more profound and powerful and peaceful. I began to see that pattern operating. But then, I think more profoundly for me, I also began to see that in the midst of fear, there is non-fear, that the knowing itself is non-fear. And that was a, a really neat thing to begin to understand. Then in the midst of my boredom, there was this knowing, this awareness, this witnessing, which itself was not boring or the fear or the typhus or whatever, and I began to understand what puru means, what this whole teaching of um, Ajahn Sumedho's be the knowing, uh, puru, uh, now is the knowing, the witness. I don't know the words in Thai so well because I formulated a lot of these things through Lumpo Sumedho's teaching and now is the knowing, but I began to have that insight. So I'd ask myself, okay, what is, I'd feel the boredom, and then I'd ask, what is not boring? And then my mind would become silent, and that witnessing became stronger. And so I began to understand what, when Ajahn Chah would talk about Puru, I began to understand to see that. So his 
Lompo's use of, of conventions, Vinaya, these very ordinary things, was a, was, a, was a really brilliant because it grounded you in the present moment in a gentle way, not a controlling way, in a mindful way. And then the transcendent teachings of Puru had a chance to be a, a parent, had a chance to become known in my own mind. And so, the, the, like the carefulness that Lompo Cha would encourage, once I was, the kind of mindful carefulness, deliberateness of doing things, I was, when I was a Samanera, I was once setting up the, the dining hall um, at, at Wat Bapong. And, you know, we usually have a, a water kettle, a spittoon, our bowls, a spoon, and a lap cloth. That's the kind of kit that a monk has. And I was setting it up. And I was pushing the spittoon with my feet, you know, playing kind of soccer. You don't do that, especially with Ajahn Chah close by. And it was, you know, he saw me doing that. And his comment was, my sue, it's not beautiful. Rather than, Vera Dhamma, you idiot. It was a lovely teaching. And I was caught out. I said, yeah, that wasn't very nice, was it? And so this sort of gentle training, I swear, not beautiful. So then I began to see the beauty in Ajahn Chah's deportment. He was the most beautiful walker. He, like he, he had this kind of regal way of, he was never rushed, never hurried, always in charge, always the boss, always the king. And he would just come into any situation totally present and totally mindful. And then in, say, in that first year when, he, when, we, when we were in England and he uh, walked in the streets of Hampstead, same walk, or walked through uh, Heathrow Airport, when Lumpo Cha came uh, into Heathrow the, the second visit in 1979, I was at the airport with Lumpo Sumedho Ajananando, who has since passed, the old Ajananando, and myself. And if you, those of you who have been to Heathrow, you know it's a total zoo. I mean, there's just too much humanity. So... These people are rushing through with their bags, and then the king comes in, Umpo Cha. Just this total presence with his, you know, Cha was only 5'2", but he looked like 7'2". And just, he just walked in. And Anando and I, we just rushed down the aisle and bowed. We couldn't, we couldn't resist him. We just bowed, and everyone's looking at us. But... That was fine. It's just, it's just, we were so happy to see him. We hadn't seen him for two years. And, and so now when I, when I think, you know, everyone, I have, I have stories of Long Pao Cha, but then I, I, I really see this wonderful Sangha, like the, the, the peers that I can associate with, um, the, the memories we can now share of our, our difficult times and so on, this, this Sangha which stretches around the world and where we can connect in a, a profound way. I don't think many men have those kinds of associations. To have so many Kalyanamitta who love this work, who work hard, who, who work on their monasteries and so on, um, that to me is an ongoing uh, joy, and, and, and so my gratitude goes to, to Long Pao Cha. And so as, a, as I began this wee talk, um, when I see Long Pao Liam, and I hear Long Pao Cha, and I see my brothers, and then I see all of you, I, I, I have this deep, deep respect and gratitude for Long Pao Cha. Um, 
So I realize you've been, you've been sitting a long time. You're very patient, and I admire your um, aditana barami, and I hope you're not too bored. Um, but in any case, I, I thank you again for this gathering, and I wish you the very best in your practice, prosperity, good health, and of course, may you realize enlightenment. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.